Welcome back, everyone. If we can just move in as fast as we can. We have plenty of chairs around the front. Don't be, don't be shy. It's okay to come down here. So this is our last session of Logisim uh, Asia Pacific 2023 this year. And we've had many questions over the last couple of days about transformation and what makes transformation uh, or change uh, and what makes it a success. So our next two presentations will be focused around transformation. I'd like to introduce Matthias de Sadlia, who's the uh, assistant vice, or serves as the assistant vice president of Group Commercial at PSA International. I don't think I need to introduce PSA. I think most of us here are aware of what PSA is. But he's had, he's had more than a decade experience at PSA and currently manages commercial relationships with key shipping line uh, customers as well as a range of strategic efforts in sustainability and digitalization to advance business and operational goals, as well as in Port Plus, seeking new growth in port adjacencies supporting cargo solutions. So today he's gonna to talk to us about delivering digital transformation success. So I'd like to welcome to the stage, Matthias. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon to all the Logisim Asia Pacific 2023 attendees, uh, colleagues and friends from across the supply chain landscape, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's been so much fun uh, being part of this Logisim event, uh, networking in the room, outside in the lobby uh, uh, with the booths, uh, as well as attending some of the very insightful uh, talks and, and discussions. Uh, I think we can proudly say that we're a very uh, that we're part of a very vibrant uh, community. Uh, we you know connect to the uh, supply chain industry in one way or another. And a quick thank you to the organizing team for also bringing this uh, a very wonderful group together. So I'll be sharing on uh, no points there PSA and uh, more specifically on our transformation journey, as well as uh, uh, also our transformation uh, sustainability journey, right? And I think. When we talk about sustainability, um, we don't really discuss why, um, why we're talking about sustainability. I think Wolfgang earlier and very passionately made it clear um, um, how urgent uh, the case is, but often we do ask ourselves um, <clears throat> as part of the industry, what can we do as supply chain stakeholders? How can we work together to move the needle in our industry? And who sets the direction at, at a global level? And you know, how can we join uh, such dialogue? So, I'll be talking about uh, PSA transformation and sustainability journey. I'll try and address some of those questions. I'll also try to make it as relatable as possible uh, using uh, examples and, and a few case studies along the way. Um, I realize I don't have a clicker, but then Martius, will you? Oh, I do have a clicker. Um, <clears throat> I have a clicker. So let's, let's have a look and, uh, and let me share a bit about how, uh, 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 to borrow uh, uh, the verbiage of Wolf Wolfgang, how PSA tries to uh, aim for the clear skies uh, for supply chain industry. So this slide is a good uh, summary of our growth and transformation journey and highlights across the 50 years that we have been uh, uh, operating as PSA. It's a chronological timeline from left to right, starting of course in June 72 when the first uh, container vessel arrived to Singapore to our back then newly uh, uh, built terminal in Tanjong Pagar. So that city terminal and, and those operations around there grew for about 25 years and then eventually uh, PSA corporatized and then uh, we had our first overseas foray into uh, Tallinn, China, right? And then across even to to date, you see that we've expanded the global portfolio of port assets, which is the red labels uh, across this uh, timeline, quite a bit across Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, uh, Middle East, South Asia, Europe, Mediterranean, and, and the Americas. And I think um, for most of you would, would know PSA in that way, right? A global port operator, but... Um, if you look at the past eight years or so, uh, and that the, the blue kind of, as the line transitions into the blue, that's really our cargo solutions uh, uh, journey. And so you look at, for example, uh, uh, you see the wider variety of colors that, that shows you know, our, our wider interest in supply chain. So the blue labels are, for example, our marine services. PSA Marine has been around since the start of PSA, um, uh, doing, providing mainly towage and pilotage but it has become a valuable service that we've also uh, um, gone and, and, and uh, 
propose overseas and expanded at scope also. So PSA Marine today does an advisory navigational audit. It provides certain water supply and bunkering services, uh, crew transfers to offshore uh, wind industry, as well as uh, training and consultancy services. The other uh, color that you see emerging uh, stronger, uh, um, but you have seen throughout the history of PSA, is the yellow and the gray boxes, right? So those are your inland container uh, warehousing and depots, as well as rail terminals. So what's different today compared to the, the, the previous decades is that previously a, a rail terminal or an inland depot would always be related to a red label, a, a deep sea terminal. But today, in our effort to expand our global supply chain uh, footprint, you will see that you know, uh, we also look at, at those kind of uh, facilities as a standalone. For example, in uh, 2016, you have British Columbia, that's uh, uh, Ashcroft Terminal, which is an inland rail terminal uh, uh, in, in Canada uh, that has uh, quite a, a good strategic value. Uh, last but perhaps uh, definitely not the least, or, or what brings all this together is the green label. So that's our cargo solutions journey, as well as some digital services. So. This is a movement, Cargo Solutions is a movement that started internally in 2016, right? And um, um, it really spurred us to look at these uh, various values across the different disciplines of supply chain. And in 2016, also an important year where we bought Crimson Logic. Crimson Logic is our digital arm. It's where, how we develop a number of uh, capabilities and platforms. The recent most significant Cargo Solutions uh, um, milestone would be uh, just last year where we acquired 100% of BDP International. So BDP International is a uh, global uh, integrator of supply chain, transportation, and logistics solutions. With that acquisition of BDP, and just uh, in April this year, we completed the integration, we welcomed about 5,000 uh, supply chain professionals into our uh, PSA family to leverage on, on their complementary capabilities as well as uh, the footprint that they have. So, this is a quick um, uh, overview of, of what BDP brings to PSA. Basically, on the left of the slide is all uh, PSA's port and port plus capabilities. And then on the right hand side is what BDP, in terms of cargo solutions, uh, brings uh, to the table uh, as an asset light and customer centric company. So how, do, how does this translate into our global footprint? If we you know, uh, uh, take all these milestones and put it on the, on the global footprint, you will see that indeed the, 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 the story of PSA as a global ports operator, the red labels, is, is there. But um, um, perhaps also uh, maybe not known to, mo to, to all of you is that there's a very strong uh, representation of that cargo solutions footprint, um, inland container terminals, rail terminals, uh, and so forth. So it, it gives you a sense of, of our global supply chain uh, footprint beyond a port operator. So where are we today? Today, about 20% of PSA's business actually comes not from the ports, but from the cargo solutions business. 80% is from ports. So it is still the core of, of, of our company. And you know we are one of the, the leading port operators in the world. But concurrently, about 15% of our staff uh, is in, in cargo solutions. Between those two classes of business, so port on one side and cargo solutions on the other, we also see there's a, a common space, a shared space, which we call uh, port plus, right? So it's an area where we uh, ambition to create new value, new synergies, and um, so what exactly is port plus? They are basically uh, adjacencies that are linked to our port operations. So what happens just after or before the ports that can be leveraged by our cargo solutions team. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, so what do we aim to do beyond the ports? Um, three main buckets of activity, right? Uh, one is connectivity services. So for example, there's a, um, a few examples here is, is uh, that rail, Genoa Basel rail, it allows um, a PSA Italy, so we have a couple of terminals in Italy, to have a hinterland all the way to Basel in Germany, so it extends that you know, uh, capability. For PSA Mumbai, another deep sea ter uh, container terminal, um, it, it has been integrated with, uh, with that rail uh, ecosystem and serves 56 uh, inland container depots. We handle 38 trains, uh, our cargo trains at, at our facility there. Uh, another interesting uh, multimodal connectivity service, uh, for example, is uh, right here in Singapore. You have the, the Jurong Island uh, barge or the uh, serving PSA uh, Jurong, right? So barging is a, um, is a far greener way of, of, uh, of, of moving your containers 
compared to trucking. So last year, uh, uh, we handled with that barge about 130,000 containers. That also means that last year, there was 130,000 less trucks on the, on the roads in, in, from our Singapore terminals uh, connecting to Jurong. The next area of, of value that we were looking to explore is flow centers. So not just warehouses, but really centers of consolidated services. There's Keppel District Park, which is quite familiar with, with um, those of you operating in Singapore. In uh, Fujio, we also have have this flow center focusing on automobiles and uh, leveraging on row row, right? So uh, roll on, roll off shipping. Um, and then um, also very exciting is a Tuas Port Plus hub. So many of you might be familiar that um, uh, port activities in Singapore are slowly moving to uh, Tuas. So we are developing a mega port uh, uh, there. But it will also be complemented as part of our Port Plus strat strategy by that Port Plus hub. So it will be a multi-story facility uh, 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 offering uh, container freight station services, warehousing, etc. And then there's a range of, of uh, value-added services uh, uh, as well that comprises um, our Port Plus strategy. I just want to maybe go back to, to uh, Fucho real quick and, and ask you guys uh, a question. So we are all very familiar with um, EVs, right? And our cars are becoming electric in a, a decade or so. So this Fujo terminal, and, and it's not just Fujo, we have a number of row row terminals. So a row row vessel is a big floating car park. It arrives and then cars drive on and off independently. So with the EVs, you know, with, with vehicles becoming electric, how will that affect row row? Do you think row row would go up, it would go down, or it would stay the same? Any, any thoughts uh, about that? Well, it, it will depend on local regulation, right? If, um, if um, you can't row row your car, if, to, to move an electric vehicle, energy needs to be in the battery. So then you can row row your vehicles on. If for local regulations uh, for safety does not allow you to, to uh, uh, fuel or, or charge those batteries, you will need to find alternative ways to, to row row or alternative ways to transport. Also, when you look at batteries, they're so heavy and, a, and quite a unique commodity. There might be a preference for the, the EV industry to move those battery manufacturing much closer to the markets and then do final assembly there. So it's just one example how PSA, originally a port operator, now a global supply chain orchestrator, is, trying, is confronted with, with uh, changing industry needs and how we can be alongside. How we, uh, it requires us to rethink a lot. Uh, we have to think beyond a container box to cargo. We have to think about how those cargos flow and, and ultimately the global supply chain uh, 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 movements. So two examples to that. Uh, recent examples, this one is just last month, um, ACC, which is the automotive sales company, it's a joint venture between um, a battery company Saft and then leading automakers Stellantis and Mercedes, right? And they are um, going to produce uh, uh, batteries in Europe. Uh, right now, most batteries are not produced in Europe, so they are trying to bring back that, bring in that battery uh, cap producing capability into Europe. The first Giga factory will be in France, and then um, uh, PSA BDP has been appointed the logistics service provider for that. So we are creating uh, nearby in Dunkirk uh, a 22,000 square meter uh, uh, facility to, to help uh, um, uh, 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 the movements of the components uh, back and forth uh, for ACC. Another example relating to how we work with uh, 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 automobile and EV manufacturing is uh, closer, to, closer to home, closer here in Singapore. Just last year, uh, Hyundai announced this partnership with uh, PSA to jointly, uh, it's a long-term partnership where we also become a lead logistics service provider uh, for Hyundai Smart Factory, which is uh, coming up in Jurong. Um, it's, a, it's a first for Singapore because it will be the first electric vehicle made here locally. And um, they have a very interesting take in how they want to uh, build their vehicles. So they are looking at um, not the traditional uh, uh, production uh, belt kind of system, but instead it will be uh, um, on-demand kind of units. Uh, if you would order a Hyundai vehicle, you choose your specs and it will be made on the spot for you. So a, a whole different way of manufacturing, which requires a whole new way of, of, of uh, managing the supply chain to serve that process. And, um, so PSA is, is, uh, is um, a p p part of that and will provide logistic solutions such as control tower management, regulatory compliance, warehousing, pre-assembly, port-to-plant, handling, and so forth. So just two examples how we leverage, uh, how we leverage uh, Port Plus 
cargo solutions as well as our port assets uh, to help orchestrate and facilitate the, the global supply chain. So this is in short uh, what I what uh, the, the first three bubbles are 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 uh, what we've uh, briefly talked about just now, right? When we look at the future or the or the so-called new normal. Um, we also recognize that sustainability will drive many of these business solutions. So, in fact, um, um, you know, the journey to lower carbon transport itself, so, so the, the actual uh, ports and trucks and ships um, becoming uh, carbon neutral will also become part of our business strategy. So, aside from change in manufacturing and industries, we notice that there's a growing demand for sustainability coming directly from consumers, from us. Right, so retailers are under more scrutiny uh, and pressure to do something about this. Um, they are required to report on their sustainability efforts, need to make sustainable choices about the products they sell, but also about uh, how they will bring those products to market. So business as usual is no longer an option because of customer demands. Um, there's pressure on retailers. Retailers, you know, pass on some of that uh, demand to uh, to uh, manufacturing, and so we see, we see all these changes in various industries. Um, the bottom example is, of course, more most relevant for the maritime industry, and it's something that Wolfgang also spoke about earlier uh, about Maersk and CMA uh, buying such dual fuel vessels. Um, in fact, when we look at the um, order book for new vessels coming on stream. Uh, I believe all of them are, uh, are requiring that dual fuel capability. So then it also means that um, if you are currently a ship manufacturer and you are still um, um, only providing traditional propulsion, you will um, struggle to sell your unit. So you, know, you might even be too late to the game, uh, but definitely need to uh, change. So that's why uh, we also say that sustainability becomes commercial. It'll be the only viable way to do business in the future. One of the reasons uh, um, or key elements for sustainability to succeed and become a cornerstone of commercial and business and eventually our daily lives um, will also be how companies are required to report on the, uh, uh, the performances in terms of sustainability practices. So we expect that reporting requirements uh, will increase and come uh, this year, next year, and continue to do so. We closely watch this space. In fact, we also embrace uh, and welcome those regulations because they will help to promote transparency, accountability, and sustainable practices across the industry. Uh, it will require companies to disclose environmental, but also social and government uh, performance. Um, EU has been actively uh, uh, providing uh, and promoting sustainability. They've developed a, a very uh, comprehensive ESG reporting standard framework. Um, in the US, we see a range of rules and requirements. Uh, various frameworks and guidelines are um, um, uh, developing there, and, and you know, depending where you also operate in the US. And at a global level, we have several initiatives as well, um, and frameworks that have gained uh, prominence. So. When, um, we, as, as a global supply chain op orchestrator, when we you know, uh, try to incorporate sustainability and make it part of our, our business, there's, some, there's always going to be uh, some risks or challenges and opportunities. Um, just now we talk about regulation, so you know, that definitely is also a, a challenge where you know, we need to uh, make sure we, we know what are the, the, the regulations to comply with, what's coming on stream, and how do we help our, our customers who interface with all these uh, things every day. Um, second one is sustainability assurance. I recently, um, I w one of the, a similar talk, heard this anecdote about a, um, on behalf of a company, a forest of a million trees was planted. It was very good uh, branding and PR for that company and a good cause indeed. So is, and, and that's it, right? But the, the next week, uh, the local sheep herders went to bring the, their livestock to that area and let the animals graze on the free saplings that were provided there. So it, it's just anecdotal, but it does show that when we undertake all these initiatives, we'll also need to uh, create the assurance, the check and balance, um, to make sure that we can achieve what we've set off to do. <clears throat> Consumer demands, we've touched on it before, uh, they can evolve and, and you know, sometimes adapt faster than our industry and processes, so we need to be in tune with that. And then there's a number of physical and, and, and uh, financial risks also involved. Right? I, I won't dwell on the, on the benefits, I think uh, we're very clear on, on, on that. Um, 
but maybe a bit more relevant to this uh, sharing on, on uh, PSA's transformation and sustainability journey is our, uh, our targets. So as an organization, we are quite ambitious. We intend to decrease our uh, absolute emissions by 50% by 2030, and then eventually go net zero by 2050. These are absolute emissions against the baseline uh, year of 2019, which is uh, more aggressive than commonly uh, or most companies. Uh, we organize our green strategies across uh, the, the uh, quite familiar to most of you, uh, scope one, two, three uh, framework. What we're really trying to do in scope one is our energy optimization approach. It's reducing our consumption. So we look at, for example, things like process optimization, uh, right, uh, which is our, how is our terminal uh, laid out? How do we streamline the flow of traffic and goods? How do we deploy um, uh, the optimal ratio of equipment? Uh, scope one covers electrification of fleets. So we have, if you look at the port, you will see all the, the trucks and, 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 and uh, prime movers and AGVs. Electrification also extends, extends to our warehousing and our uh, equipment. So, so uh, think about forklifts and all that. We also deploy fuel switches. So a fuel switch means uh, how, do, how do we switch uh, traditionally diesel uh, or fossil fuel uh, uh, equipment to, for example, LNG, biofuel, and those things. Uh, scope two really looks at how we manage our energy, um, be it um, sourcing cleaner energy or uh, also how we manage our own energy through smart grid systems. It covers things like renewable energy uh, generation and optimization uh, through solar, uh, wind, um, light optimization, conversion of hydraulic to electric motors. Um, we uh, are um, actively looking at alternative energies um, as well as um, w whatever uh, buildings and facilities we create, we also look at uh, making green facilities. Um, scope three then, um, um, which to commonly is referred to as the tough one. Uh, we recognize there's many ways to draw the line. And uh, with P at PSA, we aim at the entire value chain optimization. So we don't draw the boundary at our terminal gate. Uh, for example, uh, rail and barging is beyond our terminals, but by encouraging those greener multimodal uh, approaches, uh, we are offering greener cho choices to our cargo owners upstream and downstream. So beyond scope three, uh, our PSA's scope three reporting, but within our uh, cargo solutions strategy. So that's why we also uh, consider it. And then we look at, uh, for under scope three, we also look at green chain. So that's uh, international partnerships, both public and private, um, uh, creating green corridors, uh, uh, programs like Opti Arrive. So with Opti Arrive, um, we tell the shipping lines way in advance when is their birthing window so they can uh, adjust their speed of approach to uh, consume less fuel and avoid any uh, n um, movements uh, w when they've arrived, those things. Uh, we also um, work with embodied carbon, so it's a uh, trying to replace traditional cement to again reduce uh, uh, those emissions. So that's our general framework. Let's have a look at some, uh, always more exciting and relatable to have some examples uh, of, of those efforts. So to us uh, here in or here Singapore is, is a good example of our, our scope one and some of our scope two efforts. So if you look at the, at the, the bottom uh, right hand side of the slide is where we have our, our city terminals, right? And, and where we, you know, the, our origins. Um, it is less optimized and a lot of diesel uh, uh, traditional equipment. Right now, uh, most of our volumes are operated in uh, Pasir Panjang, where we have uh, some diesel, some uh, new energies and some uh, automation. Ultimately, we, ha we are now developing a mega port ecosystem in Tuas that is fully electrified, uh, optimized and automated. So that's a, a great opportunity to also um, uh, achieve those uh, sustainability goals, which are repeated here as well. Um, so uh, be all the operations being electrified and automated uh, to us uh, comprise of smart buildings, so the systems like lighting, heating, uh, cooling uh, are, are managed automatically to reduce consumption. There's uh, systems to generate energy, capture rainwater, special materials to insulate the offices, etc. Our new to us office building also was awarded by BCA, uh, the Building and Construction Authority in Singapore, um, uh, super low energy building certificate, so it, it's uh, about 60% less energy consuming compared to a comparable uh, traditional building. 
If you recall our sustainability target that we hope to achieve by 2030, it was cutting down our emission by 50%. So recently we did an internal study where over the next seven years, our volume of PSA in Singapore were, were projected and, and um, projected to increase, so that would increase our consumption. But the combination of moving our operations to TUAS that is electrified and uh, automated, so very efficient, in combination with eventually adopting greener electricity um, um, makes us uh, on track to meet and exceed our uh, 2030 uh, target of reducing by 50%. So that internal study is also a, a link back to sustainability assurance right you set these targets it sounds great today but you know how realistic is it are you really on track of, of being able to do it um just a bit more uh, of, of visuals and visualizations of, of some of our activities and to us uh, with our electrified equipment there's the building that won an award and then um yeah so the, the green uh, concrete is it's a uh, it's a a byproduct, a waste product that, we, that is being recycled uh, from um, um, uh, production of iron. So, um, so that's some examples of, of mainly scope one activities. When we look at scope two, um, 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 managing our, our energy sources, um, actually a, a lot of um, um, terminals around the world have become um, um, part of the energy system. Right? We, we look at greening our energy sources, taking an act, active role also in the grid management, and uh, we've been investing in energy, wind, solar. In Singapore, there's a smart grid and uh, battery energy storage system, so um, it helps to manage the national grid in, in times of peak and lull. Um, across China and Korea, we're, we're uh, deploying a number of wind and solar farms to generate our own green energy. It's uh, most cases it doesn't 100% uh, replace, but it, it gives double-digit uh, reduction of, of, our, of our energy uh, consumption. In uh, um, the, the barging project between Jurong, um, we are putting out a tender to also electrify that vessel. So beyond um, uh, removing trucks from the road, we are also looking at electrifying that barging uh, uh, to, to accelerate uh, reduction of, of carbon emission there. A number of solar and wind projects uh, uh, across MESA and EMA, as well as, as exploration into alternative fuels. Um, Scope three, it's another uh, opportunity. I spoke earlier about you know, uh, PSA, BDP coming together and you know, leveraging their strength. Uh, I think scope three, sustainability, which is a challenge for many companies. Um, this two companies working together as one will, will be a, a great strength for us. So we, 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 together we can explore how our customers uh, can achieve their scope one and two uh, emissions, essentially. When we talk about scope three, it goes, as I mentioned, beyond our terminal, so we partner uh, various stakeholders across, across the supply chain, uh, from you know BCOs all the way to to energy players themselves, um, and providing a range of services. I realize that I'm a, 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 a bit tight on time, so I'll uh, s uh, jump to, I think this uh, is one of my last uh, sharings, which is really that sustainability ultimately is a global problem. So. Any one of us can only, you know, uh, um, uh, do so much. We have to participate in uh, in um, in uh, what we're doing today, but any other global forum to drive these green agendas across the supply chain. Um, there's a lot of work um, and opportunity, as well as opportunities uh, ahead of us. It's a journey that uh, we look forward to undertaking. Today, we have a very diverse uh, group of, of of players here in the room, and I think. All of you can um, at least identify with one. Most of you are also double heading can identify with multiple of these roles. Uh, we will need all of them uh, working together, enabled by uh, smart decisions and technology. And it's what we call our, our IOL uh, vision. And with that, I, I will uh, pause it here. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, it's a great presentation and an update on PSA transforming, I guess, to a purpose. And that's why uh, PSA is continuing their success, uh, not only in the industry, but in, in the pursuit of sustainability as well. So thank you very much for the presentation.